Welcome to the Hustle and Flow podcast. The platform we use to explore varying perspectives and opinion through candid conversation. We chat about philosophy, business, and all things life. I'm Sean the Hustle. And I'm Les the Flow. Let's go. All right, guys. Today we have a guest with us. Uh, his name is Leon Cossa. He is someone who spends a lot of time in the wilderness and uh, cultivating a direct relationship with nature and its infinite wisdom. Uh, as a mentor and wilderness guide, he is a great advocate for wilderness and soul and works as a guide through rites of passage programs and educating through outdoor immersion. Leon is also a mythologist, storyteller, and a poet who uses these powerful mediums of heart and soul expression on the quest back home, which, which the soul yearns. So welcome to the Hustle and Flow podcast, Leon. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Sean. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Likewise, pleasure to have you here, man. Um, Leon, I thought it would be great for our listeners to hear a bit more about your story and how you've come to be where you are now um, from your own mouth. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sean. Well, you know, I've been recently um, really for my own sense of place, been writing a, a, a simple sort of memoir of my childhood with this notion of how do we be loyal to the bells of our village. It's another way of saying, how do we be loyal to the imagery that was so striking in our childhood, whether it was the books we read, the experiences we had, the events that happened, uh, and the things that perhaps our our great uncles, you know, grandpas, grandmas said to us. For me, I grew up in what I call big sky country. Uh, It's out there in Victoria, It's, it's vast, it's big, flat plains and you know it's a place where I grew up with stories of bush rangers the men around me uh, they worked hard they they ragged themselves in the sun they were bent with sweat at the end of the day they tear the tops off beers like ravenous crows you know parading on roadkill there wasn't a lot of space for the feminine out there I can tell you that much Um, but the sky for me became a place became a very holy place Um, I remember one evening just going out onto the front lawn and, um, you know, having a piss and looking up and just catching the Milky Way, just falling like snowflakes. And I can say wholeheartedly that that was the the first time I really felt like I caught the gods in my mouth, you know, and I tasted them. And from then on, it was, I was going for long walks with my little mutt. I was trapping rabbits, trying to catch yabbies and fish in the creek. And I was constantly um, enamoured and enthralled by this other, this otherness that seemed to exist and sometimes would lasso me um, in ways that I've only just started to learn how to articulate through poetry and through mythology. And that was most definitely the big calling for me through those mediums was all of a sudden I now had a language to understand the terrain I was going into as a child and most definitely the, the territory I'm, I'm going into now as an adult into um, the rest of my life. So it's a little bit about my childhood there. And um, one of the things that happened that was very um, poignant and changed me forever was an old farmer found a, a grave site in a hollow tree of a eucalyptus. And in there, wrapped in a possum skin, was a little Aboriginal girl. Yeah. It was something that I'd never really thought of before. After that, I began to ask Dad about the Aboriginal people. And he said, yeah, and there was an earth oven, like where we would catch the bus at the corner. Yeah, a little dusty corner. Um, there was an earth oven there where they roast the kangaroos and things like that. And I started to think, well, where are these people? You know, they were here before our family arrived here as farmers and that image of that little girl in the possum skin um, haunted me for years who was she what was her name you know um, how did she die and this sort of thing and I began to feel this strange thing that I was a foreigner or I was an exile in the country I grew up in And I began to ask these questions of adults around me. And little did I know as a child that I was prodding the underbelly (laughs) of Australian culture. You know what I mean? There's big shame in that. 
No one wants to talk about that. No one wants to turn to face that beast. And so I think then, um, you know, not having those questions guided or answered in a certain way, it led me to want to get away from that country. And um, really as a young man, I just gallivanted into to big adventures and become a bit of a troublemaker in the world because I didn't have a sense of place or belonging. Yeah. So a little Crazy. snippet there. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, man. Um, I mean, uh, you mentioned poetry and, and storytelling and that's how you and I sort of connected uh, personally. And mm. um, I've always loved the way that you deliver story and prose and I've been lucky enough to, to witness it um, in person. And I think um, that's a great little segue for us to sort of move into uh, the topic. So each, each episode, we talk about something specific that leads a conversation that, and wherever it, wherever it takes us, it takes us. And you mentioned, um, you know, facing these, these questions, these hard questions that, that um, many seem to turn away from. And that sort of reflects me on, on, on the question or the, um, the word initiation. And I think that in itself is something that uh, for most, uh, it's not, not a word that many are, uh, are commonly, um, you know, attuned to and actually know what it's all about other, outside of, you know, uh, Hollywood portrayal in, you know, maybe a, a college yeah. fraternity or even in The Simpsons when, when Homer gets uh, initiated into the stonecutters or something like that. But, you know, when I, when I talk to you about initiation, mate, what, what, what can you say about that? Yeah, well, let me, um, let me speak of what drew me into the realm of initiation, um, and that will create some imagery. So I came to a place in my life where I was lost. I didn't know if I was up or down, left or right. And I don't remember where I heard this, but someone said, find your pain and you'll find your purpose. And so <clears throat> one of my great pains was not having mentors around me as a, as a youth, elders who could actually temper that great fuel and um, raging flame yeah, of both passion and this sort of instinctual knowing that something just wasn't quite right in the world. You know, I didn't have some men around me to help guide that into something that was regenerative as opposed to something that was destructive. And so I then got involved in rites of passage work through a, just a synchronistic turn of events. And it was um, the first time um, that I heard the oral tradition used in a way that could completely shift the psyche of the whole group of men and boys. So this is a, a program where fathers go with their young boys, their sons, on an initiation, which is simply to recognise, to honour, to and acknowledge that they are going through a transition from being a young boy to a man. And that it's done in a community of men. It's the first night and it's very often that about 90% of the boys don't want to be there. They don't want to be there doing that thing with their dads, you know, on their holidays. The dads are a bit awkward for being there as well. Most of the dads didn't decide to go there. Their wives told them they had to go. It's usually the mothers who recognise something's a bit awry and, and, and the father and the son need to spend a bit more time together. Um, and some of the men, some of the, <laughs> some of the wives would tell the men that they're just going on a camping trip. They're not going on a, on a great initiation, a rite of passage. So there's a lot of reluctance, let's just put it that way, on the first night. And I, it was tense, you know. This is 60 men sitting around in a big circle, beautiful fire, a cathedral of eucalyptus trees around us. And the storyteller, uh, who's one of my mentors, he stood up, he leant in, and he said those, that immortal phrase, once upon a time. Now, I watched most of the boys cringe, you know. They're like, oh, God, man, you're not going to tell us a story. You know, I'm not, I'm not nine years old anymore. And you can see the dads kind of squirming in their awkwardness as well. Uh, but the storyteller continued. And what I saw happen blew my mind. And this is what poetry does. That's what the mythic does. Suddenly, 
there's a psychic shift that happens. You're inhabiting one place in your mind, in your beingness, in your thoughts, and a story can lasso you and suddenly you're relating to the world in a completely different way. And this story was able to create a psychic shift for the whole group. And next, next thing, all of them were in the story. They weren't just sitting around on a rites of passage camp and not wanting to be there and their lives all behind them. They were enthralled and they were traveling together. And um, when they all went to bed that night, we were on a different frontier to when we first begun in that, that evening. I was lassoed, you know. From then on, I started to apprentice myself to the oral tradition and using it in initiation because that's what the, um, the elders, you know, in the old tribes and traditions always did. They saw the power of story in initiation. Initiation simply means to begin something, yeah, and it means just to set out from who we think we are into a horizon we can't quite see yet, perhaps. We definitely can't articulate. One of the big stories going around now is, are we in an initiation, a collective initiation? Well, there's a few things that would point to, um, to that as a yes, we are. One of the main ones is we don't know what's happening. No one knows what's gonna happen two months from now, three months from now. We can have predictions. But the fact we can't see through to the other side yet, that's a very good indicator that we're in an initiation. Also, because people's lives are being lost, people are dying. You know, I'm not sure what the, the current number is, but it's significant. In a real initiation, uh, back in those tribal days, there was the risk that you wouldn't make it out alive. And if you did, you certainly weren't the same person. So my sense of it is we are in a collective initiation at the moment. We're all in this together. And it's probably the first time since, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, but we're all facing something that doesn't discriminate. Yeah, it's like everyone is vulnerable to this and everyone's impacted and affected by this. Um, and so it's showing us that old idea that when one thing happens on one side of the world, it can affect the rest of the world. Yeah. For now, I think in being true to an initiation, we're not trying to find our way out yet. We're just, we've got to learn to stomach the void. This is the time to reimagine how we could make culture, how we could make culture. And that's in all the old mythologies. The gods, what pleases the gods the most is when humans make things, when we make things with our hands. Humans are... Uh, meaning making creatures we're here to make a life to create a life and when in the Celtic mythology when the gods sit around the fire um, this is a beautiful image for me when the gods sit around the fire and they're waiting for the storyteller to lean in and tell a story just like the storyteller did on that camp when he leans in he doesn't tell the stories of the gods who do you think he tells the stories of Men. Tells the story of us. Yeah. Because we have something that they don't have. And what's that? Mortality. Mortality. That makes all the difference. They look at us and go, what did they do knowing that they weren't going to last forever, that they weren't going to survive forever? What did they do with that life? What did they make? Yeah. Knowing that that particular life, of course, many more souls will come, but that particular arrangement of bone, of soul, of heart, of flesh and guts and all the things would never exist again. That's incredibly compelling and that's us. Mm. That's us. So the initiation in the olden days, the old idea said that each one of us chose to be here, that we chose to come here and that the initiation at the, at the beginning of a, a young boy becoming into a young man was the awakening to what he was bringing into the world. You know, if you look at all the traditional cultures, they all had some idea around this and way of telling this through their stories. And no one can prove whether it's true or not. Yeah. No one can prove it false. No one can necessarily prove it true. And for me, what myth tells us is that 
it's not saying this or that. Myth is saying, um, myth opens up the imaginal realm. So in this sense of things, if I believe that I came here, I chose to be here, then when times inevitably get tough, as they do in our lives, when we enter troubled waters or the world turns upside down, as they say in the Dagara tribe in Africa, I'm more likely to get up off my ass and try something and attempt something because I'm like, well, I chose to be here. My soul chose to be here. I must be bringing something at this time. Yeah. I'm more likely when I see other people to see them um, beneath their sort of appearance and see that they, they too chose to be here and are bringing something. So I'm more likely to be compassionate, caring, um, kind. I'm more likely to be more resourceful in troubled times. And so this is the great initiation. So to wake up and realize that we, we are here and only for a short time and to maybe entertain the idea that we chose to be here for a while and see how that actually shapes and forms us as a human, as opposed to the other belief that uh, it's all just a random sort of consequence of, of life happening. I know which one I would prefer to hold. It's just more marvelous and more magnificent and more beautiful. And I'm, I'm an advocate for beauty. So I'm going with that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. Thanks so much, man. I mean, it's such a interesting perspective to take, right? And it's only, I guess it's, you can call it interesting in modern terms because it's something that isn't necessarily commonly or collectively held. And it's, mm. it just seems so foreign for, for, for many people. And um, I'd, love, I'd love to get your, um, your take on on anything that Leon has just mentioned, Sean, and see what, uh, what you've, what sort of comes up for you. Mm. So um, I've found, I've always found initiation a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting tradition. Um, I don't think there is a lot of initiation that happens um, in our modern times, you know, being in my early thirties now, there's not like a great deal of initiation that I've gone through, you know, being born, raised here in Australia. But then you hear about stories about initiations in other parts of the world. And, and more than that, you hear about initiations um, in times that have gone by. Mm. And then you also wonder when you look at how people are now to how people, um, you know, how we're told people were that has been relayed to us through stories and through history if the initiation or the process of initiation um, actually starts to that weaving of the fabric of your society, wherever that may be. Mm -hmm. And when I think about that, I think about um, how important that process and that rite of passage is for people. Mm -hmm. And the way that you've explained it there makes me just think that it is a hell of a lot more important than we give credence to because I feel like it's lost in modern, modern culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very lost in a, the sense of a, um, a cultural, a culture holding the container for the initiation. That's, mm. that's been lost for sure. Yeah. But initiation will never be lost. And, and you'll hear people say, uh, as you said, I haven't been through any initiations when in fact you've been through many, many, many initiations. Um, they just haven't been held in the community, within the culture, and given sort of some direction and some meaning, yeah, and there hasn't been the acknowledgement and there hasn't been the honouring of it and you haven't been seen and perhaps witnessed for the initiation you have been through. You know, if you left home, that's an initiation. The three, the three steps... You know, very sim simply done is in the uh, archetype of initiation is a separation, an ordeal, and then a return. And that continues and continues um, until we, we pass through, until our final initiation is the passing through the veil, you know, when we get put in the clay. Mm -hmm. But if you've left home, you've gone through an initiation. If you were at school and you got kicked out of the tribe, you went through an initiation, yeah? 
because you felt a sense of separate um, separation from a group in that pain you went into an ordeal and you had to find something within yourself that enabled you to return to a wider sense of belonging a wider field of awareness or a, a greater sense of wholeness in the world and this is uh, the tension that humans live between is between the longing and the belonging and we're not supposed to be in the belonging all the time yeah the separation has to occur like this for the third thing to come through. The mythic, it's the third thing always coming through. So whenever you get into a battle of ideas when there's a right and a wrong or a true or a false, the, the poet would say, something's trying to come through now. It's not that and it's not that. Something else is trying to come through. And the poets were able to see the ground beneath the ground that the surface conversation was happening. So one of the things that I like to work with when I mentor, um, and it's, it's mainly men that I, I'm working with, but is them going back through their lives and sort of placing these moments in their childhood, in their young adulthood or whatever, where they went through initiations, yeah? I call them unresolved initiations. They're unresolved because they just haven't been acknowledged. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The purpose of the separation is to lead us into the ordeal, is to lead us into some kind of pain and tumultuous terrain where there is a revelation of oneself to oneself. That's the purpose of the ordeal. When the revelation happens, we then make the return to the centre of our lives and show up more. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So all manner of revelation has happened throughout our lives. But without the acknowledgement and the closing of that cycle, we haven't been able to fully return to our lives with the revelations perhaps we had in the schoolyard, perhaps the revelations we had when we had a breakup with a, with a partner, or maybe when our, our mother or father passed away, or, you know, these are all initiations. Wherever there's a separation, whenever we left the country to go traveling when we were young or to work somewhere, or whether we got fired from a job, yeah? Any time we were kind of thrown into the abyss, into the void, we were in the ordeal. When we couldn't quite see our way out, we were in the ordeal. We were in an, an initiation. And the old idea says every moment an initiation. Because at the centre of an initiation is a death. Something dies and then there's a rebirth. And so they call it the threshold. And then by the nature of a threshold is you can't go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're passing through something. And so, therefore, every moment is an initiation because I can't go back. Yeah. Yeah. For that moment that just passed. And we are, whether we like it or not, in that sacred exchange every moment by the nature that we're breathing. Every moment I'm taking something in that is, not, is other than me. Yeah. So I'm in a conversation. I'm in a relationship with the other. And part of my work has been about... How do we turn to the other and actually begin having um, a real conversation with it? Because as I said earlier, these were the experiences and feelings I was having as a, as a child, but only as an adult through poetry and myth um, have I been able to find a language that attempts to communicate to that in a humble and beautiful, um, yeah, in a humble, beautiful way. Yeah. Yep. There's a few thoughts about initiation and, and, and you've been, Sean, you've had many, many, many initiations without a doubt. Oh, for sure. And when you put it that way, you're right. There is. And I think it's um, the part that I've definitely missed is the acknowledgement part of that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so do you find that to be a really important factor or really the, the determinant of how you view that initiation yeah. and, and what you take from it? It's... Um, it's absolutely essential. One of the last things we do on the Rites of Passage programs with the, the young boys, well, now they're young men, you know, they've gone through some manner of ordeal. Mm -hmm. And one of the last things we do is a big honouring circle. So there's all the men are there in the community and the young man now goes and sits up. We've got this, um, this big stone that looks like a throne, yeah, and he sits on it. And he sits in front of this community of men and the community of men welcome him 
to the community of men. One of the greatest pains of a lot of men our age is we didn't get welcomed explicitly. Yeah, that's the difference. We didn't get welcomed explicitly with reverence into the community of men. So now we have a whole generation who's asking the question, what does it mean to be a man? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And am, am I a man? And am I worthy of being a man? This is a symptom of not having that acknowledgement and that community and culture around us back then. And so these young men now stand across from their father and the father tells him everything he loves about him. I love, I love the way you care for your younger sisters. I love the way you, you care for your mother. I love the way how you, you know, you're resourceful, you're creative. I love the way you, you know, you enjoy um, drawing or whatever it is. Yeah. I love the way when your mate um, gets a dirty tackle on the footy field, you go and pick him up and then you want to fight the guy who gave him the dirty tackle. I love that about you, you know, and the, and the, and the son is receiving because at this point in time, it's important to understand that he's in a cracked open state. Yeah, he hasn't slept much for a little while now. He's in what you call uh, a liminal state. Yeah, he, which is just a way of saying his ego is kind of parted, just like Moses parted the seas. You know, it's just it's just parted like this, and he's able to receive the, the love and attention from his father in a way that just wouldn't be possible otherwise. And then the other men speak out things too that they've seen in him. Yeah, mm -hmm. when he feels seen when he feels worthy, when he feels like he belongs and that he's carrying something that the community of men need, he's less likely to get in the wrong trouble, which is just a way of trying to get the right attention. That's what our youth do. And the Irish will say, you're either in the right trouble or the wrong trouble, that life is trouble. Yeah. If you want to grow as a spiritual person, which means I want to um, step into my power, then you're going to get into trouble. You're either in the right trouble or the wrong trouble, you know, and it's a good question to ask it. You know, am I, the, am I going the right way here? <laughs> am I in the right trouble? And um, it takes us a while to discern between the two. But these young youth who go out and do these attention seeking things, there's deep pain underneath that of saying, I haven't been seen, I haven't been heard. And I'm going to do, what do I have to do to get attention? You know? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that reminds me of something you, you taught me or you told me, Leon, um, is that the question to ask again is, are you struggling in the right way? Yeah. Right. Are you, are you, is the, is the right trouble the wrong trouble? And I think that that has been, um, it's a very powerful thing to ask yourself and it's mm. very humbling at the same time. And I want to talk, and I want to talk to a few things here that um, you guys have been going back and forth with and um, hopefully they connect up, but if they don't, it doesn't matter. We're just going to be flowing around here. So you mentioned, um, you know, this connection and communication with the other and, and honing that ability or just listening, being able to listen and, and the word listen, again, is, is very key in that, I think, in that there's this difference between seeing with our eyes and listening because um, there's this connection between, I guess, seeing and modern society and how it, has, how, how it has grown in a certain direction in that seeing is sort of connected with intellectu intellectualization and then hearing is more a, a sensual thing. It's still a communication, but it's not using words, it's a different form, right? So I think in terms of where we are now, and again, this thread of people in modern, modern society not really seeing what initiation means or not really having a, a close attunement or relationship with it in their lives, sort of built on that sort of premise in that back in the day, like you were mentioning before around a container, the container was, was a small community that is always supportive and allowed the opening, the priming, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for initiation to occur, right? In whatever sense or whatever uh, setting that was. 
So we had that close knit community or even a small tribe, whatever it was, but it come to a point where we're now sort of this massive, you know, population, more than 7 billion humans. And we just don't have that, you know, that, that connection with, with our sensual side. We don't hear as well as we see, Mm -hmm. or we don't really take too much, um, you know, uh, notice even. Uh, One of the things I usually like to bring up when I talk about this is that when you hear a song that really touches and speaks to you, you don't really know how to describe it, but it moves through you. And that is a, that is a form of communication, right? And that is telling you something, you know, it, not, it needn't be profound. It could be, but it's just highlighting that there is a communication occurring between you and these vibrations that, that are being made by the sound. Right. Yeah. So that's sort of lacking there. But then, like you said, back to this container or this removal from, you know, a uh, small knit community that is holding the space to this vastness of, of detachment and individuality now. There's, yeah. there's now that lack of acknowledgement. We're not being taught about what this is. Where, in fact, we're leaning the other way. We're, we're, we're running from initiation. We're running from that from that that trauma that hurt because that's what is uncomfortable right and we're actually being conditioned to turn away from that so we are uh i guess less equipped individually to deal with these you know moment by moment initiations that we're having Mm -hmm. in fact we could say that we're stockpiling all these um Un- unresolved initiations as you mentioned you know and they're just building up and building up and building up inside of ourselves you know until it comes to a point where we have to release that pressure valve and it comes to a point where you know things just snap but yeah. that that last straw that breaks the camel's back yeah yeah i have a uh, as you were saying i was thinking of you know and I, I really agree with that that these unresolved initiations build up and we're not able to move into a wider circle of belonging and participating in the ongoing creation of the universe. And there's a poem by Rilke, and there's a few different translations, and, and I don't know which one I'm using and whether I'll get it properly um, correct. But it goes something like, I live my life in expanding circles. I live my life in expanding circles. I don't know whether I'll finish the last one, but I will give myself to it, or that will be my attempt. And here's Rilke sort of, I guess, in a way, talking also about an old idea in alchemy, which is called circulatio, which is the same thing that we live our life in circles. Or if you look at a tree, it's got the rings. Yeah. What does a tree do every fall or autumn? It, ha- it surrenders. It lets go. And that the very thing that it lets go of goes in to the mud of creation, into the dark soil beneath and becomes the thing that carries the nutrients for the regrowth and the next expanding circle that it lives in. So it's a beautiful thing. You know, one of the ways to look at initiation is just simply the way that um, our ancestors looked at nature and were listening very, very deeply and observing very deeply that there seemed to be a rhythm and a cadence and a cycle that was happening. And they are recognizing that, oh, we're nature too. If we don't do something like that, if we don't find our own way, our our human way of living in these cycles, we're probably gonna get in the wrong trouble, yeah? So let's find, let's create sacred holding places, containers for initiation to take place so that as a community, we can continue to expand from, you know, into the core of the earth right up into the, the far Milky Way because that's possible for a human being to exist in the deep inner and the deep outer all at once. Not all the time. I mean, that's not necessarily my attempt to do that, but it is possible to have moments of oneness, of wholeness. Um, so 
as you as you said, you know, really beautifully, I think that with all these unresolved initiations, we're not able to complete the cycles that we were living. And so we're, what we're seeing often, then it comes up in our relationships, you know, and I've seen this in myself, uh, ways of behaving where I'm like, hold on a second, like who's in the room here? This, this isn't my 35-year-old self. This is like my 13-year-old kind of angry at the world kind of self, you know. Something hasn't been completed from way back there. Um, and so that will keep rearing its head until, you know, Sean, as it's acknowledged, it's honoured, it's found a way to, to see what the revelation was in that ordeal and find a way to bring it into the frontier that we're living on right now, the centre of our lives. Myth is always saying both. It's saying go to the edges, go to the far edge of the wild, primordial, deep forest, yeah, and speak to the wise old man at the end of the world or the wise old hag, you know, and go go into the underworld and that sort of thing. But don't stay out there, you know. You've got to come back to the castle as well. You've got to come back right to the centre. You've got to hear the trumpets blaring that are saying it's not time to come home. Yeah, because we need you in the centre of things. And the old idea is whatever revelation you have, whatever gifts or visions you receive through all manner of ways out there on the edges of the world, you never fully receive the fullness of them until you make the return back to the centre. Because they're strictly not for you, actually. They're to be given. They're gifts to be given. And the gift for you is in the giving of them. Yeah? Yeah. But if, you, if we don't give the gifts we came here to give, we actually are living on the take. That's the most confronting thing. We're actually, we're not, it's not a neutral thing. If I don't give my gifts into the world, it's not just like, oh, he didn't give his gifts and it's a neutral thing. Actually, I took, I took from the world. And that's why I'm very, um, you know, I really like Stephen Jenkinson's work around, around grief. Because what he's saying, when people get to the end of their lives and they've got all these stockpile of unresolved initiations, what they have to wake up to in that moment and the reason why they're dying with a wretched anxiety, because they don't know how to die, yeah? They haven't died all the little deaths along the way, so they're terrified. And what they have to wake up to at that point is that for most of their life, they lived on the take. Like, who wants to wake up to that? Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally, and be- beautifully said, man. Like, um, just to, and and I think that that classic, um, that classic story, or that classic way of telling the story of uh, the castle at the center, but then just playing on the edges, right? Playing on the edges uh, between that dark forest, but then returning back to, with with the wisdom or that uh, whatever it whatever it is that the um, the the other you know that your dark the, the shadow sister or brother has has told you from that um wow. shauna I, I want to throw to you shauna um and i want to i'm sure that you yourself again uh, reflecting back have gone through a few initiations yourself without having you know that that um you know that ceremony or ritual surrounding it but can you reflect back and sort of put into that context and, you know, maybe share a little bit about that? Yeah, I think I've definitely gone through different experiences in my life where, you know, there's been a separation and then an ordeal that I've had to deal with. And it's true. Um, I explained that once you pass through the threshold, you can't go back. Mm. You are now that new person. Um, and I guess what I'm thinking about as well is we, you, um, you mentioned the wrong trouble and the right trouble. And what I'm trying to figure out as well is like, how do we know that we fi- we're finding ourselves in the right trouble? <laughs> it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, have you ever been at a time in your life where you're like, I'm, I'm happy, I'm single, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kicking goals. I don't want to be in a relationship. Um, and then, you know, you don't even try to, you don't even attempt to, but there's a woman across the room who catches your eye in a way that you're like, um, she, let, she lets you see her. She, she looks at you in a way where she lets you see her. Um, that's a thing that women can do, you know. Um, they let a man see, see them. 
And when, when that happens, we're like, oh, no. <laughs> it's like we know we're in for trouble there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If we go there and, there's, and there is attraction and there is connection and you journey with that soul for a while, you're getting in trouble. And for me, when it feels like something is pulling us that we can't quite articulate and we're not trying to sort of cut compartmentalize or um, interrogate with our mind when it feels like something is doing that to us that feels like the right trouble to me like I'm gonna go with that feeling you know because it feels almost offensive um, to ignore it mm -hmm. you know um, that's the idea of the calling when you ask someone like, why did you, so why did you go to that country or why did you start that? And, and at the time they say, I, could, I didn't really know why, I just felt called, yeah? yeah? If we don't follow the calling, my sense of it is we end up in the wrong trouble. And all the wrong trouble is, is the soul creating an external drama that is big enough, that is loud enough, um, that is painful enough to wake us up and hear the calling over there, yeah? And to, and to kind of turn our compass, it might even be just one or two degrees. It, sometimes it can be very subtle, but over the course of a human life, it's exponential, yeah? It's like shooting the arrow. You move the tip of the arrow one degree over the course of 50 meters, you know, you're, you're way off the target. Mm. So the old idea is saying that something is always calling to us, is calling to us deeper into our lives. And if we're listening, and that's the key part, Leslie, if we're hearing it, because it won't come through in words. Words are something that humans invented. There's an older way of thinking, and it's thinking through imagery and listening in ways, and, and it's, a, it's far more subtle. It's why poetry is such a beautiful thing, because it's getting in touch with that more infinite, subtle and wiser part of ourselves. That's the part of ourselves that writes the poem, not the, not the one who grabs the pen and sits to write. You know, that part of us doesn't finish the poem, might start it. And so when we're in tune with our calling, the calling is quite angelic. We're just following the threads. Doesn't mean we're not getting in trouble. Yeah, it's the right trouble for sure. But if we keep ignoring the calling, it has to get louder, and it becomes more demonic and it will pull the rug from under our feet. It will make relationships collapse. It will, we'll lose our jobs. We'll get, we'll actually get physically and physiologically sick, emotionally unwell. We'll start to feel anxiety, depression, because there's a depression of the soul. We're not listening to our soul. So we feel depressed and all these manner of symptoms begin to arise um, until we wake up, and realize that that thing has been calling us for many, many years. Yeah. It's, and it's been haunting our lives. Yeah. And anything that haunts our lives simply wants to disappear by notion of us turning, like in the old myths, turning to face it, turning to face that which haunts us and asking it the question, what, what, do, you, what do you need to tell me? What have you been trying to tell me that I've been so foolish to ignore but I've been so arrogant to think that I knew everything and we turn to face that more infinite it's the wild twin as Martin Shaw um, would call it wonderful book um, maybe you can post it in your notes or something like this with this podcast okay. um, you know and, and say what what can I do for you now you know what do you how, how, how do I walk on from here in a genuine way and it means forming a deep and intimate and trusting relationship with that otherness. Yeah. And that's yeah. the shift. And that's the shift from looking for the answers in our lives to asking the questions, to living the quest. That's a big shift because there's, there's uh, humility in that and saying, I don't know everything. There's curiosity in that at the heart of any artist is a, a curiosity. There's like asking questions of things. Yeah. There's, um, there's wonder and there's awe in that and there's appreciation, there's gratitude in it. Yeah. It's, um, that's what the poets know. They know that your name is Sean. Yeah. But also that's not, that's not totally the truth. 
Yeah, your name is Leslie, but there's, that's just the name you've been given. What are the what are the other secret names for you? Yeah, and the poet tries to write about. He, he's attempting to write to the essence of things, and the essence of who we are has a thou, hundred thousand names, as many names as there's stars in the sky. Yeah, and when we come into contact with that, we start to understand this question that Carl Jung said was one of the most important ones to ask, and it is: Do you believe you are married? or part of you is um, connected to the infinite or not. Yeah. That's a big fork in the road. I'm not saying one is right or wrong. It would just create a very different life. Yeah. yeah. These questions by the nature of being a good question will totally shift the ground beneath our feet and reshape our identity as much as any answer we could possibly get. That's when you know you've asked a real and beautiful question and you know by the nature of it then that you have to live it for some time. You have to temper that question with experiences. You have to bring that question from the internal realm into the realm of your, your work, your life, your relationship to self, to your family, your loved ones, um, and see how it, how it wants to temper you. Yeah? And it becomes your own then. And that's wisdom. Yeah. What yeah. someone said was wise a thousand years ago is not necessarily wise to say today. <laughs> yeah, totally. It doesn't work like that. Wisdom is connected to the moment, to the, the, to the now, but it has also got one foot in the past that is connected to, to the infinite realm. And when you connect the two, it's possible something wise could be said or yeah. be known in that moment. Mm. Yeah. I think these times are asking us to just, just turn and face and go, what have we been ignoring? What haven't we been listening to? And until we do that, we can't actually reimagine a future that allows humans to live on in a genuine, sincere way that has, in my sense of it, a deep kinship with the otherness. And for me, that's what's been getting us in trouble. Climate change has been going, you know, and that's just a name for it, saying like, hey, look, you guys are, you know, this is not sustainable if you keep living like this. Coronavirus has been able to do what climate change couldn't do in 35 years, has done it in like three or four months. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like that uh, releasing of the uh, pressure valve this, because you see a lot, again, a lot of the commentary surrounding these current times, um, you know, for context, we're recording this uh, at the very end of April, 2020. And um, you see that there's a lot of, uh, sort of uh, humor being made around this particular year and uh, people just want to forget about 2020 and that's the, yeah. that's the general sort of um, I guess culture that we live in now we want to forget rather than actually sit with yeah. it and understand and acknowledge and delve deeper and ask the questions and I think that's mm -hmm. such a, a beautiful but subtle way to, to, to shift the way that we think that instead of seeking seeking for for answers mm. we just simply live within the questions you know in one side it there's there's arrogance and there's ignorance that comes with it in in believing that we know um the truth of the universe and then the other side is just a humble noble honest way transparent just to say that i don't know and I just want to continue to find out as much as possible. And that's it. I just want to continue to delve deeper. Um, so that's something that I myself have really come a lot closer with, you know, in recent times, the last six months or so, mm. just really drawing towards the beauty of paradox and questions, you know, because that's all it is. This, this, this world around us is like this gigantic paradox, this gigantic contradiction um because it's this tussle between intellect and and sensuality um and i think that in itself is like where like you said leon poetry is a beautiful medium because it's it's kind of like leveraging what we have created intellectually to to in a noble attempt you know to express what we feel in our hearts 
Mm. And, and it is just an attempt at, 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 at the most part, you know, it's never really perfect, but that again is part of the beauty of it as well. You know, poetry and storytelling. Mm. And one of the things with, with storytelling and to just jam off what you were saying there is that we do, we do live in a culture that wants to forget things. Um, I was just trying to find then there's a poem. I can't remember her name. It's, it's Ali someone. I'll, I'll find it and send it to you so you can put it in this, um, in your notes as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's an indigenous woman. She was part of the stolen generation. And this poem says, starts off, sit down, sorry, camp, sit down, sorry, camp. Um, tell them a story might take a long time might take a day, might take a week, but tell them a story. And it goes on and on and it, and it uses the word story 20 odd times in the whole poem. And the essence of it is saying that just because we said sorry, you know, whenever that was, I can't remember, um, you know, like that's not it. Every year you've got to keep telling the story of the genocide that happened here. It's going to be hard for our children to hear going to be hard it's going to be hard for us to retell you know but we we just had anzac day here where we keep telling the story you know we've got to keep telling the story of what happened on on this um this continent otherwise it gets perverted we're not actually standing on the ground of reality yeah and we get we then we tend to get either aloof or arrogant um and and sort of walk with an untempered grandiosity yeah, if we actually came to ground and continue to tell those stories, um, we would be far more humble and we'd be far more in connection to the oldest living culture who had intimate threads to the otherness. Yeah, we could learn so much from them. But that's a very confronting conversation um, for us to be in and we've got a lot of ground to make. But all the Indigenous cultures, they didn't just tell their stories once, whatever the stories were. They told them again and again and again because the stories were what held the fabric of culture. They knew that the stories were the most potent way to hold all the big ideas yeah, because it held them within imagery. So you didn't have to sit around the fire talking at each other back and forth. These, image, this, these beautiful images and myth, one really beautiful way to just think of myth is it's a way of thinking through imagery. Myth just means image. Let's put it that way. So instead of um, trying to think through words and abstract thoughts, we can start to use imagery. Yeah, if I say yin yang to you, either one of you, all of a sudden it just poof, opens up a whole archive of thought and ideas and wisdom. Yeah. Or I could talk for about 15 minutes about what the yin yang is, you know, and never quite get there. So imagery is like these potent ways of holding deep, deep wisdom. And they, these stories were told again and again and again, not in the same way, not in the same way it was told last year. It was told in the way it needed to be told. The storyteller, there's three things happening when a storyteller is telling the story. He is in the imagination of the story and he's throwing, he's, he's throwing the bones at the people. He's throwing the, the scaffolding of the story. And then he's also getting tempered or influenced by the imagination of the people around the fire or the imagination in the room because he's listening to them as well as, as, you know, them listening to him. But then there's also the imagination of the other that also wants to speak through the storyteller. And one of the most beautiful things that, you know, Martin ever said was, don't, don't forget that the story is, the story you're telling is not just for the people who are listening. They're, they're, they're all listening. Yeah. They're all listening. So invite them to the party. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. And that's why I guess it's, um, it's something that story is something that um, has always been with us, you know, and it always will be with us. Right. And, and I think it's important the point you made in terms of it being told in different ways Mm. for that particular moment in time by that particular person for that particular group. Right. And I think it comes back to this, this thread that you're mentioning about myth and imagery 
uh, Carl Jung, he, he uses the reference of symbols a lot. Mm. And, it, and, it's, and it's just amazing and fascinating that you'll find symbols, like for the circle, for instance, is, is like cyclical. It, it symbolizes nature and life. Yeah. That, that is found uh, throughout recorded human history in every single culture that you can think of back then. But they just interpret it in a different way that is fitting and suited to their culture at that time. Mm-hmm. But it's amazing that if you think back then, they didn't have the internet. They couldn't Google, you know. What, what are those guys thinking about symbols and life? But they all see the same thing and then just interpret it in a different way based yeah. on their local culture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So it's, um, The word template has the same linguistic origins as the word temple. Yeah, and so one of the, the holy shapes, not just the circle, but the triangle, was taken from the holy places in nature, which were seen as the mountains, yeah? Mm. These big shapes like this. And that's why you'd see all your, your churches with the wide base at the bottom, the big spire at the top. And most of these old churches also have like secret compartments and dungeons and basements in them, which is representative of the underworld of the human soul. You know what I mean? You're just taking the template. But we forget that it has to be a wide base. To be able to, to, be able to hold that depth, yeah, it, we need a wide base. And I think with the, um, the disintegration of culture, and my sense of it, is Australia, where we're, you know, we're having this conversation, has a big identity crisis. We're not quite sure, you know, what it means to be an Australian. And it's very difficult to have a cultural initiation when culture seems so fragmented. And so what we're getting is all these people self-initiating themselves. What are they, what are they initiating themselves into? And one of the old ideas says that it's very difficult to initiate yourself um, because you'll either go too hot or go too hard in the ordeal <laughs> or you won't go hot enough and you'll come out like, uh, you know, half-baked bread. Um, that's why the community, they're, they're, the community's job, and, you know, on the quest, on the, on the vision quest and the wilderness vigils, the main job for myself as a guide is, is just two roles, really. It's to say, um, I've got your back. And it means two things. It means when you're up there on the mountain and you're in a sacred communion, you've created your temple, which is your quest site, and you're fasting up there for four days and four nights. If something goes wrong, uh, I've got your back. We're, we're down here. We're not fasting. We're eating. We've got a car or we've got the phones or whatever. If something goes wrong, we, you need to come down we've got your back. It's also saying that once you've had your experience up there, you've got somewhere to return back to where you can be, as we were speaking about earlier, Sean, where you can be held, where you can be seen, where you can share your story, uh, and you can be witnessed in the, um, in the sacredness and the potency of the container that's being created. Um, because if you were just to go out to the world and tell someone what you experienced on them up there on the mountain who doesn't understand that and hasn't done it before, they'll, they'll say something like, oh, sounds, um, sounds interesting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it hurts. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, takes- I definitely, definitely had, a, have had a few of those, mate, when I uh, explained <laughs> that uh, particular experience. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, what I want to talk about, and I want to ask you, Sean, um, I want to return to a thread that um, Leon was mentioning, just about <clears throat> um, these, maybe the ignoring or not hearing or shutting our ear to certain, you know, callings, right? I know yourself, I've, I've known you for over a decade now, and I know you've had, and I can think of a handful of examples where you could, you know, um, tell our listeners about and what, what, how they went through and what they led to in terms of an initiation process. Mm-hmm. Could you describe one of those and tell us what that was like, you know? Hmm. I'm trying to think. I think uh, before I talk about any particular experience, one thing that, um, you know, 
I've been thinking about while we've been talking, which has come up is the shedding of something old and that there is a release, right? And when I think about that, I think about, like I have this image in my mind of being in a little boat and you're sitting next to a jetty, right? Mm -hmm. And you're holding on because you don't want to set off yet. And it's because you could be setting off into the ocean and it's like the deep unknown right but out there there's the beauty of nature you could arrive at a new place that you know is so much more beautiful than you ever imagined there can be people there that change your life but you've got to let go of the jetty to actually be able to you know you need to release and and you have to release yourself essentially and i think that's really hard for people to do because there's so much that, um, you know, in my life personally, there's been so many um, good things that have happened throughout my life. And, you know, you relate or you give meaning to certain experiences you've had. And if you choose to let go, you're letting go of the opportunity or the possibility to have those experiences again in a lot of, a lot of cases, mm -hmm. right? It's like I think about when people uh, decide to move their lives, um, you know, a lot of people, the reason people will give you a lot of times is I have all my friends and family here. Right. And you have all these beautiful memories and experiences with them and, and they've shaped you and you fear that you're not going to have those types of experiences again. But then you also, you know, have plenty of people around you, especially these days that do move and they go and they have these amazing experiences and their lives change. Um, and they continue to be great or, or even better. Mm -hmm. So this whole notion of, you have to let something go to gain, to, to arrive somewhere that, that could be better for you and, and essentially to get yourself into the right trouble. Yeah. Um, I find that has been, for me personally, like the hardest part, right? Yeah. I think it's really easy, not really easy, I take that back. I think it's um, a much different prospect for you if you're trying to let go of something you don't want. Yeah. As opposed to... Um, you know, if there's, if you're in a situation you don't want to be in, you tend to run, right? And, and you're letting go of that. A lot of times you're being forced to, but you arrive in that place. Whereas letting go of something that, you know, that you treasure is very hard. And I think about that, you know, when I was, um, <clears throat> just when I chose to go into to working for myself and doing my own business, right? Like you, you have a lot of comfort when you work with other people. Um, you know, I learned a lot of great things from a lot of people um, when I did have a corporate job, you know, for quite a time, I was surrounded by some great mentors, people that I'd formed really close relationships with people that are still great friends of mine today. And it's very hard to see where you're going to end up um, and where you're traveling to and letting go of things that, you know, have served you well in your life. I think it's very hard, but yeah. You know, when you do choose to let go, there's this whole, like, there's this abyss, there's this magnitude of possibility that opens up for you. Mm. And, you know, I've now, through going into business for myself and, and, you know, essentially letting go of the jetty and traveling out into the ocean, there's been other ships. Yeah. There's been, you know, I've been able to talk to people and, and work out what they're doing. It's, it's expanded my horizon into what else is available for me out there because, mm. I've let go of all these notions that I had about how things should be because now I see how they can be mm. and letting go has mm. enables you to do that. And, but the other thing that you mentioned Leon, which is really interesting is um, you know, when you spoke about how the tree in autumn sheds its leaves and that goes into the deep soil and that's what's used to create this new ring of your life, mm. I think is really important to acknowledge as well because you don't let go of everything right and and you take certain things with you and i think that's also important to acknowledge is like what are you taking with you and what are you using to build these new rings yes yes um so many beautiful threads there man um you know one of the one of the experiences i had with um some of the kids and youth i used to work with is they were suicidal yeah and, and no one wants to talk about it with them. Mm. It's even like the counsellors say, don't mention the word. You know, we've been taught to not even talk about it. 
my sense of it, although I think it would be rare in the, in the older traditions because they were so aware of these things, but when you see a young man who is having these thoughts, it's a, one of the greatest indicators that he's ready for an initiation. Do you know what I mean? Because something wants to die. What happens, just to thread it back to this idea of, you know, you, there's something you do take through with you in that threshold, is they confuse them, that it's, they, they confuse it for themselves. They think that they have to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they don't take anything through. But it's always the question, well, yeah, something needs to die. Well, what, 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 what part of it? What isn't working for you anymore? What do you need to let go of? And there's all manner of relief when we realize we don't have to relate to ourselves like that anymore. We don't have to be in that conversation anymore. When we get bored of ourselves, again, it's a great indicator that something else is trying to come through. Yeah, and, and what I, I think I'm seeing now with the way our life has sort of just been discombobulated and certain luxuries and comforts and normality has been taken away from us. For a lot of people, um, at least I think their souls are really glad about that. They're like, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. And there's no choice in it. You know, it gets taken away. And this threads back to this idea of, um, you know, where you were first jamming about um, the sacred and making a sacrifice, which just means to let go. To let go of something means to sacrifice something. When we let go of something, when we make the sacrifice, we make something sacred. Yeah? Wherever the sacred is present, there's power present. Yeah? That's why when you, before you walked into the churches, there was the gargoyles and that up there. You know, it, they're, they're saying, like, be careful now. You're entering that shape. You're entering that triangular shape, which is a powerful shape. You're entering a place that is sacred. You're entering a place of power. You're going to come up against your inner demons. Yeah? You're going to get challenged so you can actually hold that power. So what links to our power, for me, is our truth. It's all we have. So when we're entering the sacred... We're sacrificing something that's no longer true to us so we can walk deeper into our own truth, which is to say we're walking deeper into our own power. The deeper we walk into our power, this is the real initiation, we're going to get challenged at that level of power. This is why we have core issues, yeah? Why we have complexes like authority complexes or self-worth complexes or sex or money complexes. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It's just that they're complicated. <laughs> And they're complex. And when we're moving like the, the ring of a tree, we face those core issues on that level of power and that level of belonging. And then when we move into the next ring, we face the core issues again. And we keep facing them all our life, and that's why they're the core issues. So we will always come up knowing that, knowing that I'm always going to come up against this, oh, can, I, can I really do this? Am I enough for this? Am I worthy of this? And be like, oh, yeah, there's that thing again, you know, at this level of power. Because now it feels like there's more at risk, yeah, yeah. or I'm more vulnerable. Yeah. And this analogy of, or this image of the ship, you know, I think a human is a vessel. And that's why we're in relationship with the world. And just like that old saying says, you know, a, a, a sailing yacht or a ship looks great at harbour, but that's not where it belongs. Mm. You know, it, it's a place where it can come to. And I spend a lot of time at sea working with some pretty radical, um, wild buccaneers, you know, with the Sea Shepherd crew. We were Neptune's Navy, and we'd go out to sea for 40, 50 days, and I loved throwing the lines off. It was, it, I loved coming to shore. We'd go to the bar and have a dark beer and have a whiskey and go and listen to some music. It was a glorious thing, you know, and to have your feet on the earth in that way. But then when we threw the lines off, the amount of relief I felt, oh, I don't have to worry about that anymore you know when i'm moving between worlds now and a human is always moving between from belonging to longing from port to port and the oceanic um you know the oceans between yeah which are the depths of soul it's important we come to port for sure and refuel and resource and 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 see our loved ones and pay homage you know but we're not supposed to belong at port either, but I can totally understand the fear of letting go. And I felt that so often because um, that's a death. Mm. It's a death. And one of the, it just, it's just symbolic 
of one of the deepest fears we have as our culture is that we're mortals. We don't want to turn to face one of the things behind us, which is saying, do you know there's a locked mystery? Do you know there's a treasure, treasure chest that you'll never have the key for? And it's the time of your death. We will never know. And everything that you know and everyone that you love will too one day come to pass. So what are you going to do with your life? How are you going to live knowing that? Are you going to live it in a way where your story is worthy of the gods sitting around the fire, you know, leaning in and saying, this is how Sean lived his life. This is what he did knowing that he couldn't survive forever. Mm. Beautiful imagery there with the, um, always love to, you know, think about, you know, from the center of the tree and moving out where it's just continually expanding the, those edges, you know, we're just pushing those edges out and out and out. And that's just, that's just part of it. And again, we're talking to the culture as it is now, and it is completely counter to, to that, right? It's just about this inability to, to let go, the inability to acknowledge and recognize that it is a, 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 a walking the tightrope, essentially, right? There's never going to be a solidity to our lives. There's not always going to be solid foundation beneath our feet to walk, you know, but we cling to that so dearly and it is because it provides us with comfort, but it is a, a, a sort of a delusion as well, right? That we're tricking ourselves with, that we're always going to need to be safe and held and be walking on ground that's never going to be, you know, uh, even a, a degree, you know, off center, that's always going to be nice and flat and it's going to be sure. And we know everything that is on this path and it's spick and span and it's beautiful. But I think, you know, going back to the thread that we were talking about before in terms of how that manifests, you know, and how that comes out, it's either this gentle, you know, tap on the shoulder to say, hey, maybe it's some, th this is a question that you need to ask yourself and ponder, or it's gonna be the rug pulled beneath our feet and we're just gonna land on our ass break our co coccyx and say, oh, fuck, all right, I've got to wake up. Like, like, you keep, like we keep uh, referring to back to this point in time, you know, there, there's this uh, ever-growing um, thread and uh, indication of, of world climate, but it's something that we've continually ignored. And then all of a sudden in 2020, we've had these horrendous bushfires and then we've had COVID-19 that's the the rug from under us and i think in terms of individual individually we can always think of the same sorts of examples for ourselves if you're in a relationship and there are these questions these hard questions or hard converse, confrontations or conversations you don't want to have with your partner with your spouse mm -hmm. so you just sweep them under the rug until they explode and become this all out you know um uh, argument between you guys like and and you know you, you, uh, it becomes very uh, emotional and it becomes very you know uh, violent and incendiary yeah you know and and even if you talk about how it can manif manifest physically like um i i always talk about this example but i i truly believe that you know uh i was in a situation myself um, for, for many, many years where I was ignoring many, many questions. I was aware that they were there and I was aware that they were asking and they needed to be uh, sat with and asked of myself because mm. I was playing different roles that I, I wasn't meant to be. And I kept ignoring them and ignoring them. And, you know, you'd cover them up and you'd escape and you'd, and it, and you'd just try and forget until it comes up as something that you just can't ignore. And that for me was cancer right? Mm -hmm. So there's so many examples of those sorts of things. And I think a lot of these modern words that we, we attach to these or associated with, it's, it's like gut feel, you know, intuition, whatever you want to call it, you'll know for yourself, you know, as long as you give it space and sit with it. Yeah. Yeah. And listen. Yeah. Yeah. And 
understanding that that message doesn't come in a well packaged, articulated way. You know, 100%. often how we want to relate to the world, you know, with all our padding and our straight corners and things to be neat and tidy and, and safe. And, you know, and what did the Irish poet, the only sense of security is a false sense of security. Mm. Like that message is only going to come in. It's going to come in kind of a, a mysterious looking way. And it's asking us to trust it. It's asking us to let go of something, to walk toward down a path that just down the way is winding out of view. And we can only come to see what's around that corner when we get to the corner. It's really the only, only sincere way of, of living. And along that path, we will come up against whatever we exiled. Yeah. So the old idea and one of the messages in all the, the, the folk telling traditions is that whatever gets exiled doesn't disappear. It doesn't just, it just goes underground. It goes into the underworld and waits for us. <laughs> just waits for us there. You know what I mean? And at some point, we're all going there. We're all going there. Um, and I don't mean that literally in our death, but, you know, when we're in the ordeal of a relationship breaking down or losing a job or losing a loved one, we're in the underworld, yeah? And, and all manner of things wait for us there. Mm. Um, and how well we grieve at that time um, is proportionate to our renewed sense of love in the world and how we can appreciate and show gratitude to the world around us. And also it's, it's wise to remember that, you know, if you exiled something, just because you turn and say, oh, sorry for keeping you down in a dungeon for the last 20 years, like you can, you can come out now. Um, it's not going to be happy about it. Do you know what I mean? There's going to be a bit of a battle. There's going to be some words said. Yeah. Like you were saying with your example, when your partner's, wanting to have a conversation and you, you know, you keep putting it off, putting it off. And, and um, eventually you turn and go, okay, let's, you know, oh, I get it now. Duh. And they're not going to be like, Oh, great. Let's have a hug. You know, often I've been trying to tell you for the last, you know, and, and then <laughs> what, what as men we don't know how to do. And I've been so guilty of this. It's just accept that that's the next wave of response is whatever was exiled needs to be heard in its ferocity. And as men, we need to be able to stand and just cop that because behind that is the balm of the coming together. And so it's a nice message that comes through all the folk tales that, you know, it's A, it's waiting for us. And when we do turn to, to it, it's not necessarily going to be benevolent. Yeah. <laughs> it, will totally. it will ultimately, you know. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, man. Thanks, Leon. Shauna, do you have anything else to add, mate? You wanna you wanna say? No, I covered a lot and I've learned a lot about initiation and the acknowledgement of it and, and what the process actually is. So thanks for that, Leon. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Yeah. So thank you, Leon. I want to and I want to and I'm gonna pull a um a little reference from, you know, um the Dr. Martin Shaw. And thank you for you know, being the blue feather to Sean and I's black and white in this, in the uh, magpie, mate. I, I know you'll uh, understand that reference. Um, but yeah, uh, would you like to tell the audience where they could possibly find you if they wanted to connect and find out more about you, mate? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I'm pretty underground at the moment and in the process of bringing myself more to form in the creation of a website and certain programs. So they're all in the, in the brew in the barrel at the moment, um, you know, like a good whiskey, uh, but absolutely on Facebook, um, you'll find me there and Instagram. So it's just Leon Cossa. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I'm the only one that comes up, so it shouldn't be too hard to find me if you spell it right. And, and really like as far as something that anyone who's listening to this and has felt like they've got something out of the, the conversation and it's stirred some kind of communion um, with their soul, then my, my most sort of um, emphatic advice is to, to follow whatever's calling you, whatever it is, and, and know that there's going to be some fear in it. And the fear is it's showing you exactly where you need to go. Like whatever it is, if it's to go and um, ask that, that woman out on a date or to call 
your your father and have that conversation that you've been putting off for for decades you know what i mean to go and start that business you know to whatever it is that's calling you like if we don't heed that call the opposite happens yeah and and the muse stops visiting us because it says well we, we we come and we we give the message but it doesn't get heated yeah and we actually become um zombies we become dead men walking because we're not living in the vitality of the frontier that's trying to commune with us, which is constantly a threshold that we're walking step by step, every moment and initiation. It's a bold, bold thing to live a human life. It really is. The courage it takes to love is no small thing. But what else are we going to do? Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, man. And um, I guess if anyone wants to find out and join you on any of uh, your mentorship programs or, or wilderness uh, retreats and vision quests and things like that. We'll put the link up for flowstay.co. Yeah. Flow yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. So how about you, Sean? Where can uh, everyone find you? Best place to find me, Instagram, just Sean underscore Coop, S H A U N underscore C O O P. Cool. And uh, for me, it's just on my website, finding space.co. And in on Facebook and Instagram as well, it's at findingspace.co. So drop us a line there. Cool. And I just want to thank you as well, Leon, for coming on today and taking the time to explain, you know, these concepts and things that I feel a lot of us don't think about. And, you know, it's something that we always ignore, but um, the way that you've put things forward and been able to share the approach that people can have and how they can view the world so differently it's beautiful, man. And I just want to thank you for that. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, received that. And it's been, a, been an honor and a pleasure to chat to both of you. Awesome. And for those of you listening, if um, I'm sure you got a lot out of this conversation, if there's a nugget, something you feel that would resonate with someone. And, um, you know, I would also, this is one of the episodes I would definitely implore people to wind back and listen to again. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much that we spoke about and, there's different parts of the conversation for me personally that, you know, I felt tugging me. And as you said, just delving down that path, I think is so important. And one thing that you mentioned, which was, you know, the muse visits you, but it will stop visiting you. I think that that definitely is a thing as well. And I think it would be such a shame for (laughs) that muse to stop visiting you or to, to not explore. All right. So, um, yeah, I would wind back, listen to this really, Uh, explore within yourself and if you found this to be helpful for someone else that you think might want to delve down that path as well please share it out Um, you know we always ask our audience that if you did find value in this just to share it with one other person it's how we grow and how we can um, impact people through our conversations so with that thanks for joining in and we'll see you next time all right see you guys